to have God speaking to me as to which specific direction God wants me to enter into this morning and therefore I attend to you to be focused in your hearing ability I tend to you to be focused in what it is that God is about to say to you this morning know this that this is a an appointed time not necessarily by yourself but by God amen are you ready we're gonna find our scripture and not for the screen yet because I'm not going to start uh, at the scripture but just for you to get the scripture ready Ro um, Romans Romans 2 the 6 to 10 but allow me just to start and you can say amen as I start this morning. Amen. God wants us to become the glorious church. Isn't it so church? It's the hour is extremely critical and therefore there's a demand placed upon the church today to become a glorious church. The Bible speaks theologically of the glorious church that God and Jesus Christ will come back at the end of life at the end of this earth at the coming of Christ he will come back for that glorious church it is in this hour that I believe we have to strive and become desperate to become glorious people and it is the makeup of glorious individuals people that are in a glorious place and I've preached about this for the past this is the fourth week and please get the CDs to give you a better perspective of what it is that I'm talking about. God takes us through a process. Everybody say a process. And the last time I ministered, we said the process starts at salvation. Then the process moves to faith to faith. And then the process uh, concludes at glory to glory. And many people do not access their place in glory. Their place in glory is a mature position in their spiritual walk with God. A place in glory is also a place where we don't deal with things as ordinary. Amen. A place in glory is where God allows His reflection. Because the, the, the New Testament reference to glory is bright light. So when the glory of God penetrates through us, we become that glorious individuals, that glorious church. We then become that shining bright example of who God is. Can you say amen to that church? So when I stand in any environment and whatever it is that I do in my gifting, when I stand and the glory of God is reflected on me, it projects who God is to those people that I'm in that environment with. So wherever you walk, wherever you are, wherever you go, God wants to reveal His glory upon your life. Amen. The hour is critical. One of the reasons for allowing us to celebrate Africa today, and we are also aware of our many African brothers apart from just South Africa. Any of the other African brothers here with us this morning, can you say Amen. You can shout amen. amen. Praise God. Amen. The hour is critical for Africa to rise to the place where we become that glorious continent. I shared a week ago when we prayed, I shared if you live at 57 Sullivan Street, 69 Sullivan Street, I got the number wrong, 69 Sullivan Street, all you're concerned about is what happens in 69 Sullivan Street. When you get on your knees, you pray for 69 Sullivan Street. I know you pray for your address. You just pray your, your stuff concerning yourself. But do you know that if God is doing certain things on the continent of Africa, and if God is doing certain things in, in the country of South Africa, it will affect 67, 69 Sullivan Street. Therefore, we must become aware of the fact that God wants this continent to become a glorious continent. But watch how the enemy is challenging Africa these days in stepping into that glorious season of our lives. We had the issue with Pastor T.B. Joshua where this building collapsed. I shared with you two weeks ago that I neither speak against it, I neither speak for it. There are so many unclear stuff. I also heard news that one of the biggest Christian networks 
one of the, the, the directors have stepped down from management because of a moral failure. There are so many issues that Africa is, and they're from Africa, they're from South Africa. There are so many issues that Africa is contending with right now. And when we become aware of the issues that Africa is contending with, we must know God is getting ready to reveal His glory upon us. We in Stimberg, in Council Boulevard, it's a world-renowned street. We must become aware that God is getting us ready to step into that glorious church. Amen. What God is doing in New Hope Church, and I need to hear the church agree with me, what God is doing in New Hope Church, we must become aware that God is getting ready to shift us into becoming that glorious church. What you see it happening around us is not just another Jonathan Butler concert. It's not just another women's conference. It's not just another youth uh, trying to have something in a hall. No, it is the glory of God getting ready to be revealed upon the church. And you've got to get behind it. Amen. Amen. If you want to be part of that, know this. You can become part of that glorious church. So for the past week, the subject of glory was reflected in one message that was uh, we are preaching on prepare for the weight of glory. One message was titled, I want the glory. And the last one was the process to glory, which is salvation, faith to faith, glory to glory. And I believe in particular, I want to continue a little bit on that. In particular, the message that I preached last teaches us that when we on, on, in the process or on journey to, to glory, which glory has different definitions. Glory is a place in heaven. Glory is also a concept of living here in this earth. Glory is also an atmosphere. Because when the worship goes the way it went, there is a glorious atmosphere in this place. And we can also sense the glorious atmosphere. Therefore, we can have the glory on us. And when we leave this place, the glory will depart. Because of you showing your finger to the brother that's trying to get in before you. Or you have an argument with the husband at home. And the glory just departs because the glory is on you. But when the glory is in you, you can then move into environments. And the environment will submit to what the glory is on the inside of you. Amen. Amen. So these messages are important for you to understand what God is going to do today in this place. So this morning, listen to me carefully, I want to, to teach this morning on why it is that many people never arrive at that glory place in their lives. If you're a musician, you've got to get God uses your gift and your talents, mix it with faith. So that you can get to a place of glory where the reflection of God is expressed through the gift. In fact, God takes over that gift and He uses us on His behalf. So whenever you stand there, it is God that people see and hear. That is the stage of your glory. When Pastor Brad stands at the Good Hope Center, which is a glory move of God to get him from the Civic Center to the Good Hope Center. It is the stage, it's the journey that God takes you. There's a thing that God is doing in my life as well. He takes your gift, He takes your faith by faith and shifts it into different levels. Therefore, your business as a business person cannot remain at, 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 at the place of battling month after month. You've got to get to a place where you have glory in the business, where you can just write out checks and know that the money is in the bank. We must strive to that place because God wants us to get to that place. Whatever it is that you do in your schoolwork, in your studies, God wants you to position and navigate yourself through a process, through the journey to a place of glory. So this morning I want to teach on why people never arrive at their place of glory. And then I also want to teach on the same subject, why those people that arrive at their place of glory. Why it is that they cannot maintain their place of glory. 
You've heard of many great men of God. I've just mentioned now the couple that runs God TV, how he is submitted to moral failure. He has stepped down from glory. Why is it that God allows men to go through the difficult challenges of life, but when they get to a place of glory where everything goes well, failure steps in. My wife sat next to a, 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 a wife of a very big church pastor, and all of you guys know him. I'm going to avoid to mention his name. She was privileged four years ago to sit next to her. And she mentioned this. The question was asked, why did their marriage fail? She says, we were not aware. We were in ministry 20 years. When my husband gets behind the pulpit, the anointing of God is so evident on him. Yes, he prepares, but when he gets behind the pulpit, the anointing of God just comes upon him. And that which he prepared doesn't even matter anymore because God in his supernatural glory just starts using him because he's the place of glory with his preaching. When they come, money just comes in. There's always enough money they have. They have money. People bless them consistently. It's a place of glory. And this is where the enemy stepped in. Today they divorced. Why is it that many people cannot maintain the place of glory? Just our, one of our darlings of South Africa, Mr. Oscar Pistorius. He claims to be a Christian. The Blade Runner that stunned the world. He was at a place of glory. He could buy the cars he would like. He could buy the guns he would like and so forth and so forth. But now that he's at the place of glory, why is it that he fails at the place of glory and cannot maintain his life at glory? So I'm going to teach you this morning and I feel the anointing of God. Why is it that some people do not ever get to the place of glory? And why is it that some people never maintain? And a place of glory. And I said at the first message that this was not meant for your prayer for me to preach to you, but this was meant for God speaking to me personally. And I'm just sharing this with you just in case it means something to somebody this morning. Why is it that many tongue speaking believers, why is it that many long serving Christians do not get to the place of glory? A little simple, and listen, I'm sensitive to people back then. We battle our whole lives. So it is not God's intention. And the reason why I'm saying this is because I love you. It is not God's intention for you to battle throughout life. It is God's intention for you to initially start out life like that, but get to a place where you serve God and God blesses you like Rowan preached last week. That is God's intention. And you're not after material things. And I will share about that in a minute. But you're after the glory of God. You see people come, I'm sick. I need money. I need a job. Don't be after the job. Don't be after the money. Don't be after your healing. Be after the glory of God. Because in the glory of God, anything and everything can happen. Is there a church that believes me this morning? Therefore, we got to pursue the glory of God. But before I really get into it, I, I, I need to share two things with you. Two things in preparation. The first thing is that the process to glory is a journey. Everybody say a journey. <coughs> the journey is made up of moments. Everybody say moments. So if you look to my left, that's where the journey starts. If you look to my right, that's where the journey ends. But in between, my life time or my timeline there are moments and my life and pursuit towards glory is made up of moments this day here this morning is a moment in our pursuit of glory can somebody say amen, amen. if you don't take advantage of the moments that can even just have the glory on you and a compilation of that many moments of glory that will get you to your ultimate destination, which is glory. So life is made up of a journey. And life is made up of moments. Cherish this moment today. Don't easily let the devil rob you of being present in the house of God. Where you can experience another glory moment. Tell somebody a glory moment. Because when you, when you experience a few glory moments, it will navigate you to your place in glory. And the second thing that I 
I'd like to share with you before I, I really get into preaching is the fact that we have become a convenient generation. We have become a generation of convenience. Whatever we do, whatever we strive for, is to become comfortable. The man works overtime so that he can have more money, so that he can buy the big plasma. Be comfortable. Be convenient. I will sprung up a big screen watch. This generation, and I'm not talking about a group of people, I'm talking about this time dispensation that we're living in. This generation is a convenient generation. We buy things to make life convenient for us. I put, if, if, my, if my car is cold, I put a button on and then my seat warms up. <laughs> if it's too hot, I put the aircon on. It blows me cool. I'm just talking about cars. You even have today what they call run flat tires. You will never get a puncture. We're striving for convenience. Our whole pursuit is to become convenient. And when we become convenient, we think this is the ultimate in life. And often we associate the convenience of life with the glory of life. Can I push this thing? We think that we have the glory of life because everything is now convenient. Look at them, they don't have If, if any man has passion for this world, 
The passion of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, watch this, is the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. So here you come, is this Michael okay? Here you come because of your convenience, you strive for convenience, even accepting the gospel I preach. God is good. He will give you 20,000. He will give you this. Will. It's not about God will bless you. Yeah. It's not about making life. In fact, in fact, God is more concerned about your, about your maturity than he's concerned about your comfortability. Sure. Yeah. It's in the uncomfortable inconvenience of life that maturity comes forth. So the convenience of life brings us into passion issues. When you're so caught up in the stuff of this world that you, you have so much passion for the world things where you're supposed to have, as Matthew 33 says, seek it first. You must first have a passion for God. And then every other passion must follow and submit to the passion that you have for God. But today in the church, and we even bring that into the church, the passion of the world. And the Bible says, for all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Continue. Continue. Push you and the, and the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. What the text says is if you if you have the passion for the world, you cannot have the passion for the Father in you. And this is what the inconvenience and the convenience of life does to us today. Mixed passions. Mixed passions, passion issues brings us to the subject that I want to speak about. And I'll be 10 to 15 minutes on it, but then I'll be done. These mixed issues, these confused passions, passion issues brings us to the subject that I want to talk about, which is disobedience to God. Disobedience to God. But pastor, I'm not disobedient to God. What prevents you from stepping into your glory place? Disobedience to God. What prevents you from maintaining a life in glory? Disobedience to God. But pastor, I am not disobedience to God. I am not disobedient to God. But let us check. Let us check. Let us read Romans. Romans, Romans 2, verse 6 to 10. And maybe for this moment, you can stand for the reading of the Word of God. Would you like to stand for the reading of the Word? I'll be 15 minutes and I'll let you release you there. Who will render to every man according to his deeds? That is what you do. What you do. Some people, some interpretation says, who will, remember, who will render according to faith? Because faith has deeds. Faith, faith has works. Who will render to every man according to his deeds? To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immorality. Immortality. Well, that must be something wrong when I say that. <laughs> Rowan spoke of honor last week. By doing honor takes you to glory, takes you to immortality and eternal life. Continue. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, those are those that are disobedient. <laughs> But obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jews first and also of the Gentiles. But 
glory. Everybody say, but glory. Say it loud. Come on, say it like you really mean it. You can see by the text, the very text we read, there is a place that God wants us to arrive at in our pursuit of life. In fact, the pursuit of life should be about the pursuit for glory. Whatever it is that you do, both secular and ministry, it should be for the purpose of achieving glory. The world takes glory as fame. We take glory as reflecting the image and the presence of God. Amen. I think it is Deuteronomy and maybe Rowan mentioned that scripture too. Deuteronomy speaks of today you decide. Today before you God gives you a decision to make. Blessings or curses? Let me read the scripture. Let me read the scripture. This is only in reading. Deuteronomy 11, verse 26. See, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. Watch this. The blessing if you obey the commands of the Lord. The curse if you disobey the commands of the Lord, your God, and turn from the way that I command you. Today, by following other gods which you have not known. So to obey takes you to your place in glory. If you live a life of obedience unto God, obedience to the voice of God, obedience to the word of God, obedience, submission, which are dealt with in the other parts of the sermon, Submission to the leadership of the church, to the leadership and parental submission. If you submit to that, it brings you to a place of glory. Everybody say amen. amen. The question is, are you obedient? The question is, are you disobedient? It is the disobedience that don't allow us to access the place of glory. It is the disobedience that takes us from a place of glory. So how is it that we are obedient, Pastor? How is it that we are disobedient, Pastor? Let me submit to you the following. And you got to really take notice of this church. It is something new to me. It is something new to you, maybe this morning as well. There are levels of disobedience. There are levels of disobedience. I want to talk to you briefly about the levels of disobedience. You know, in school they teach you about the trapper of from fat like What do you say that in English? The traps of <laughs> What this is really saying is that you start out at some place that is seemingly insignificant and if you can continue your pursuit then it actually takes you to a place of significance. So you start out small and it takes you to a bigger dimension. So you can be a little bit disobedient. But having a lot of little bits of disobedience, it eventually takes you to another level of disobedience. So the different levels of disobedience starts out somewhere, but watch where it ends. Are you ready to go with me? The levels of disobedience, you've got to write this down, you've got to get this in, give me the levels of disobedience. The level, first level of disobedience starts with iniquity. Now iniquity, well let me go through the list. 
The second level of disobedience starts if you allow your iniquities to have its full way in your life, it moves to transgression. Another level of disobedience. If you allow transgression to have its full way in your life, it then leads to sin. And if you continuously sin in your life, it takes you to trespasses. Trespasses. That is how the proper English people call them. Trespasses. Trespasses, as you say in Council Boulevard, takes you to eternal death. How many know if you see a sign that says trespassers will be prosecuted? Yeah. You jump over the fence, know this, the Salapur is of your mistake. Yeah. <laughs> because you knowingly step into an area where you know you're not supposed to step into. And certain death will follow. Yes, yes, the thing that's important to us, just, and I want you to listen to me very intently. This will be quick, and then I will close. We all have iniquities. We are born with iniquities. It's the first level of disobedience. You have the seed of disobedience in you. And I look you in your eyes. I have the seed of disobedience within you. It is called, the first level of your disobedience, it is called iniquities. Iniquities is also called the bloodline negativity in your life. You know that thing that you inherit from your father? That thing that you inherit from your mother? That you don't like of your father? As much as you don't like it, listen, it is in you as well. You got to believe me whether you like it or not. Your father has caused that it is a sea of disobedience in your life. We all have iniquities. You've got to be aware of the fact that we are not sinners by what we do. We are sinners by birth. Because we are here today, because we have been born in the sinful world, we have within us iniquities. No one is without sin. Jesus Christ, he was without sin. He took the sin of the world upon him because he had the bloodline of the Father in his blood. Therefore, he had no sin. But we have the roots, the seeds of iniquities in us. Let me, let me just expound on what iniquities is. So, so you just go back to the to the to the levels of disobedience. So the levels of disobedience progresses from iniquities to and I'm moving around so that everybody can see. And it gets worse to transgression, and it gets worse to sin, and it gets worse to trespasses, it gets worse to eternal death. You can interrupt that. That is why people never get to their place in glory. That is why people never maintain their place in glory. Iniquities, listen to me church, iniquities. The Bible speaks of the iniquities of your fathers that we are born with. What are iniquities? Iniquities are the negative passions. Iniquities are the negative desires that takes up residence without our permission within our souls. It does not ask, hello, can I come inside? Before you know it, you have the iniquities, the seeds of disobedience within you. It takes up residence. It's negative passions, it's negative desires. The devil that your father faced, the devils that your mother fought, are the same devils you will fight one day. You've got to get ready to fight those demons. It is in your bloodline, it is in your life, it is born, you're born with it. If you ignore the devil, because most of the time you try to ignore the devil, you can overcome the devil. That is what I need to say to you at this stage. Amen. Don't sit there hopeless and say, oh my goodness, where am I? Listen, you can overcome before the end of the service. You will be more than overcome. Amen. Because the revelation is, pray for my voice.
knowledge, the revelation is, the revelation is by your understanding and catching a revelation, you will be able to walk free yeah. from the iniquities that you received back then. Amen. In fact, let me say this before. Ephesians speaks of, you know, when psychology, look at the time, I need to finish this quickly. Psychology says when they want to determine what your problem is, they sit with you and they talk to you about your past. They try to figure out what happened in your past. Were you raped? Were you molested? That's why you display today psychological negative tendencies. We do that in church too. So we try to go back to where it all began. Can, can, can I tell you this? That's fine where it began, Gerald. But before the beginning began, there was another Gerald. That Gerald was blameless before God. That Gerald was clean before God. But when you were born into sin, you start a new life with a potential, with a great iniquities embedded inside of you. Seeds of iniquities inside of you. And the devil is waiting. The reason why many of our people can't believe glory is because we are so unaware of those iniquities that are embedded within us. And therefore the devil catches us unaware. I share with my wife, I say this with confidence. My father was a good man. He also had iniquities. But I did a of this with frequency. Can I say it like you say here in the kitchen? I must say a of this. He didn't mess around with other women. So another woman can come to me. It's not in my iniquities. It won't matter to me. I will speak to you about how beautiful my wife is. I told you the story, and I'm going so far away now. Let me just go on. I told you the story. I stood at the Bobby County here down the road, and, and an old school friend of mine looked at me from the other side. She was going somewhere else, and my wife was sitting in the car, and she looks at me with those laser eyes. <laughs> Everybody said the mind. 
So if I use the example that I just had, here's this woman, you process those things in your heart. Mm, not bad. Something happens in your mind. And guess what happens when you get home? You sleep and your mind is alive. You dream dreams. Have I got a number on my cell phone? I'll phone it tomorrow. Transgression. The Bible, the Bible says that Jesus Christ died for all our iniquities. And he died for all our transgressions. That means, here at, though you, your father was who he was, your mom was who she was, you're sitting with those seeds of disobedience in your spirit. Here comes transgression. Transgression place is the place where the iniquity wants to process itself. In your mind, in your heart. So now I see the girl and the devil wants me to take a number. And when I get home, my mind works. I'm sleeping next to my wife, but my mind works. So where, where shall I meet her? What, what where time shall I call her? You know, that, that's why guys don't give their phones to their wives anymore. Who what did I say to say that? What did I just say that? The phone is a holy cow! When you think it's there, 
Now you think about it. Now you process it in your heart and in your mind. And now you actually step up to do it. And then you ask yourself, but why did I do it? You are angry with yourself. That's the sound from earlier church. Yes, Come on, help me somebody. Don't be surprised. Yes. You, do, you wonder, why did I do this? I, you're guilty. You are so sorry for why you did this thing. It's because of iniquities inside of you. And you allow the transgression to processes. And now it has manifested itself. Manifestation. The next thing, and, I'm, and, I, and I can speak a lot about that. The next thing is, therefore, we have to confess. When, when we get to a sinful stage and you've done certain sins, you've got to confess your sins. Repent it before God. Give it to God. Then God goes through transgression, He fixes up, and then God goes into the and He destroys the dead. Yes. Therefore, when you get saved, it's not the ultimate in life. You're only starting the journey out. Yes. You're not going to heaven just because you got saved. Just because you're getting baptized, you're not ready to go to heaven. No. It's part of the process. It's another moment in your journey. You still, when you got saved, the iniquities, the transgression, the sin, all of those things are not just disappearing and it's still there. You're still living in this earth. You're not in heaven yet. Because in heaven there is no sin. The next stage, the next stage is trespass stage. Some people call it trespasses. Some say trespasses. <laughs> trespasses mean trespasses. I always remember this. I used to play a lot in the mountains. I used to play a lot in the fields. And we used to play various games. And then whenever we get to a sign that says trespasses will be prosecuted, then we stand there. Who's going in? <laughs> no, I'm not going in. <laughs> No, let's go in. Then the one that's uh, the, the biggest mouth, he goes in. You know? But you stand in front of the board that says trespassers will be prosecuted. Then you give some, someone a name there. Now they say trespassers will be shot. Yeah. Will be shot. <laughs> the thing with trespassers is, here's the thing. You know you're doing wrong. Yeah, sure. You know what yeah. you're doing is sin. Yes. You know what you're doing is against the will of God, it's against your brother, it's against your sister, but guess what, you still do it. And you continually do it. Watch what happens. When you continuously trespass, one boundary after one boundary after one boundary, you take yourself into the next thing, which is eternal death. Eternal death is not where you die, Bodily, it's not where you die physically, it's where you die spiritually. I have truly sat in front of people where I preach to them the gospel, where I talk to them about the issues of life. Then I realize, it does not speak what God cannot do and can do. But you get to people and say, if you don't do this thing that I tell you, you must do. You're going to remain in a life of trespasses. Guess what happens? Eternal death. Let me tell you about eternal death before I move on and close. Eternal death is, the example that I want to use is Adam and Eve. The Bible says that God came to commune with them in the cool of the day. And they should not eat of the tree of good and evil. And when they were disobedient to God. The Bible says, after they ate of the fruit, they sinned before God. They knew that they should not do it. So they trespassed. And they continued to do it. I want to go back to something else, but let me just conclude what I'm saying here. So when they were thrown out of the garden, the Bible says they died. But guess what? They still had Cain and Abel after that. So they did not die physically, they died spiritually. So we have many people that are alive in the natural, but they are dead in the spirit because of iniquities, transgression, sin, trespasses, and eternal death. Let me tell you the story very quickly. It is the story of creation. Therefore, submission to the Word of God 
Obedience is so important. The Bible says, obedience is better than sacrifice. Some people say, if I don't have money to give, I'd rather be obedient. It's the horse, it's a party from the horse. If you're obedient, you will give. Therefore, the Bible says, obedience is better than sacrifice. If you give, it doesn't mean that you can't continue in your obedience. The Bible says that God used a serpent in the disguise form as Satan to come and visit Eve. Now you might have heard this little story before, that the serpent had little legs. You know, a desert fruit? A serpent probably looked like that. But when the serpent was used by the enemy to deceive and bring Adam and Eve into disobedience, God cursed even the serpent. The curse of the serpent was that the serpent do not have legs. You will sail on your stomach for the rest of your life. Can I push this a little bit further? The serpent is one of the only animals. The serpent and Yemina, we are the short crowd. The serpent used to have titties. For the little ones. <laughs> well, but this is the only way that I can explain this. The serpent used to have titties for the little ones to suck on. To feed the little ones. But the serpent was cursed when that was even removed. Now watch this. So when a baby snake is born, the baby snake comes out of the egg and immediately he leaves the mother. No animal, it's the only animal, after birth immediately leaves the nest. That means the serpent does not submit to leadership, the serpent does not submit to teaching. The serpent does not submit to mentorship. He leaves immediately the rest because of the curse. Therefore, teaching, submission is part of disobedience and a curse. That is why people don't step into their glory place. Disobedience, curse, is why people cannot maintain their place in glory. I conclude like this. God has given us a tool, everybody say a tool, to test iniquities, to test transgression, to test sin, to test trespasses, test, test, test to test eternal death. He's given us a tool. Two tools. And you beware when you step into the stool. The enemy wants to captivate you with this. Yes, are you ready for this? Yes. And you have been visited and you will be visited with this. Don't bring it up yet. I'll find it here. The enemy will visit you with bitterness and offense. Yes. If it takes you into bitterness, it's the place where you can work your iniquities to transgression. If it takes you into offense, that's why church, do not let yourself stay. Get bitter, get over it. Be offended, get out of it. Yes. Because the longer you stay in it, you get cursed. You will never get your place of glory. Two tools you can check and test where you're at. Some people come to church, Filled with bitterness. Some people come to church filled with the other one. Filled with offense. Some people sit that side because they're offended by the brother on the other side. Some people sit at the back because they're bitter. They used to sit in front, they sit at the back, now they're bitter. Listen, when the enemy takes you into bitterness and offense, you are a target to go into your iniquities. You will never get your place. I wish we could continue, but I have to go on. Let's just stand in this house. Let's just stand in this house. Everybody raise your hand. Everybody just submit to the Lord this morning. Everybody just, just stay.
thank God for where you're at this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, in Jesus' mighty name, in Jesus' mighty name. Can, can, can I, can I, yes, let's, let's pray, let's pray, let's pray. Let's pray, let's pray, let's pray. Let's pray, let's pray, let's pray. Let us pray, let us pray. Thank you this morning for your word. The enemy is a liar. He has no hold over us. Let me change my The enemy is a liar. He has no hold over us. We have been set free by the power of the Holy Spirit. 